हो गया थैंक यू सो मच All right. I hope. Okay, Karan is saying we can hear you now. All right. I um. I usually look at your comments, but I thought I'll just start till the time you will join, and I couldn't really. I hope all of you can hear me. But is the screen visible now? Yeah, the screen is also visible. Perfect. Okay. So very very quickly, we were talking about French writers. I was giving you an introduction as to how these French writers are influencing the entire. overall of our english writers starting from the initial days where we can see that english is having many french words for example we also have indian diplomats who are traveling to france and in exchange they're getting the french tradition for example chaucer was inspired by roma de la rose so we can clearly see that france has held a very important position in england it's influenced the writers who were writing in england and not just that otherwise also we have a lot of french literature that is available in translation uh, for us english audiences and thus you have a lot of questions that are coming in your entrances regards to, with regards to your french writers okay so in today's class we would be looking at your french writers and before that i was telling you that how your european writers are important okay so here we would be looking at both your french writers we'd be looking at writers who are important from your examination point of view we'd be looking at their important works which are crucial from your examination so all these aspects we will be looking at when we are discussing french writers okay all right um no uh, Ani uh yeah anita alexander this is what i was telling you uh, at the beginning but i think the voice got cropped up uh, this week onwards of course we will continue with your crash course on british literature but remember uh, rather than uh, devoting 5 days for britlet we will be giving 3 days to britlet and the other 2 days we would be focusing on other aspects also which are crucial from your examination point of view so it's a very good question that uh, anita alexander has asked we will be focusing on your british writers but uh, we will be giving the three days so for example thursday friday and saturday we will do your crash course and tuesday and wednesday we'll do something other than your crash course the other important topics the other crucial topics which are important but otherwise of course we would continue with your crash course in your uh, the remaining three days so of course don't worry your entire british literature will be covered over here through our platform platform you're at grade up so you don't have to worry at all about it. okay good evening everyone let's just quickly start all right lichi was getting worried i'm so sorry lichi i couldn't see the messages earlier okay let's quickly get started let's quickly get started with our french writers and in today's lecture we will look at writers we would look at their works which are important and i was telling you that french writers have always contributed be it the writers like racine be it writers like cornell be it writers like moliere or all the way if you talk about writers like uh, jean paul sartre for example sartre is influencing our absurd drama is influencing uh, the entire notion of existentialism we also have albert camus who becomes one of the first important writers to get the nobel prizes from france and albert camus is writing about the myth of sisyphus he's talking about modern life in particular so definitely all these french writers be it writers who are writing in an earlier century or writers who are currently writing in the 20th century for all of us uh, not currently but in the sense like the modern period for all of us they are all important from your examination point of view okay uh, for example gustav flaubert is important emil zola is important why zola is important because zola is the pioneer see french literature is important because you look at the movements if you look at the modernist movement symbolism is coming from france particularly existentialism is also something that we have bequeathed from the french writers then when we talk about 
about uh, absurd literature absurd literature also in a way coming from the writings of albert camus who's trying to give us the myth of sisyphus besides this look at look at your realism so balzac is becoming one of the pioneer writers who is helping us with the gift of realism naturalism which is stark realism is also coming from france in the form of emil zola then of course we have writers like gustave flaubert we are having writers uh, who are writing in between as french writers who are crucial from your examination point of view so in this course we would be looking at right absolutely absolutely sneha one must imagine sisyphus is happy this is what we are talking and this is what we are doing we do the same things every day and we must assume that we are all happy that is how life goes on right so we will be looking at this pioneering literature of france that's coming from the french territory and we will look at some important writers and how questions are getting asked on these writers in your exam so when we are talking about french writers one of the first most most important writers that we have is Gustave Flaubert. Flaubert is writing Madame Bovary or Emma Bovary, which is starting an entire tradition, so to say, of women domesticated or women trying to come out of the domestic sphere, women who are trying to assert themselves, women at the center. Critics say, just like Elizabethan literature had put man at the center of the universe, the Victorian period in Europe. The Victorian period in Europe was trying to put women at the center of the works of art, right? So women are clearly occupying the central positions in writings. Uh, as we can see, the eponymous name of the character is itself a woman. Many critics also say that that was done because the audiences predominantly for the consumption of novel were women. But still remember that nonetheless, these writers are crucial for presenting the domestic sphere. Gustave Flaubert, he's a very influential French novelist, and he is one of the pioneers along with Balzac when we talk about realism in France. Realism was nothing but these novels which were loose baggy monsters. Loose baggy monster, a term by Henry James, is basically telling you that whenever you look at, for example, if you look at your Middlemarch, it's a thick book. Or if you look at your, uh, like, you know, William Makepeace Thackeray's works, they're again thick books that he's writing, right? Why? Because they are trying to give you a detailed description of the occurrences that are taking place. Even if they're creating an episode for you, they will describe it in greater details. They will put a lot of rich values to that, that right? So do remember that Fleurbart or when we talk about Balzac, they are all proponents of realism in France, okay? Very popular for his first published work called Madame Bovary. Very popular for his first published work called Madame Bovary. And uh, of course, we have Gidi Maupassant, a celebrated short story story writer was a prodigy of Fleobath. He was actually a prodigy, a finding of Fleobath itself, okay? But what you have to remember is Emma Bovary or Madame Bovary clearly sets prototypes for multiple kind of novels which will be having a similar theme. Fleobath had once said, woman is a vulgar animal from whom man has created an excessively beautiful ideal. So, you know, Fleobath would always say that, you know, the what does this line mean? This line means that patriarchy has tried to stifle the instincts of women. Patriarchy has stifled. This is what he was trying to say, that patriarchy has stifled or suppressed the instincts of women, which was his ultimate goal because he wanted to bring the instincts back. Instincts of women. So that means women were dehumanized. The instincts are central to any living being. An animal, a human, they're all having instincts according to Fleobath. And Fleobath was saying that patriarchy has systematically systematically avoided this section of the society. They have told them that you don't have any instincts. They have suppressed their instincts and the vulgar animal. What is vulgar animal? Freud will say that the vulgar animal is your unconscious. Your vulgar animal are your inner thoughts. So can you just see that these kind of writers are actually a precursor to the writings that were basically modern in nature? 
right all these writers were in a way precursor to your modern psychological novels because your modern psychological novels were also looking at this only that is the reason psychoanalysis would look at all these works again and again so can you just see this line this line is so important <coughs> Okay, okay, SK, what are you discussing? Okay, Blessing is asking what book can we refer? Any world literature book that you have is a good book. Any book on world literature can help you. So you can go for any book that is dealing with world literature that will help you. Okay, all right. So patriarchy has stifled the instincts and that is the reason why we are saying that psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis actually becomes very important, right? Psychoanalysis becomes very important. Escape, you have a lot of like, you know, doubts which are basic in nature also. Please feel free to ask those doubts also. Okay, don't worry about the, the nature or the category of doubts. Even if you're having similar simple doubts um, which you think uh, like you know are really stupid also please ask them okay so of course uh, we uh, need to remember about Madame Bovary which is clearly an important work right and his other major works are of course memoirs of a madman sentimental uh, sentimental education dictionary of received ideas these are the other works which are there now Madame Bovary this was the debut novel this was the first novel and the novel is actually telling us the story of Emma Emma has an adulterous affair and she tries to she tries to move away from this life which has domesticated her right uh, many people said that this novel was obscene because it was showing a woman who was desiring to have a love affair because she was not happy with her bland married life so we can clearly see that many people considered this book to be extremely obscene and that's the reason we also see that you know uh, this book was also banned in 1857 the work is an example of literary realism right so flu bath is basically trying to give you a realistic attribute a realistic look at how the society has given acceptance to the instincts of one section of the society that is male and they have justified this instincts whereas female have been idealized and their instincts have been suppressed which is why they are suffering from what of course freud will later say hysteria so emma bovary's frustrations emma bovary uh, you could say repeated spats and banters with her husband with a doctor husband clearly represent the fact that she's not at peace internally and why she's not at peace because the society does not let her vent her own opinion so you can clearly see that this work was very radical for the time that it was written so thus this book was banned of course we have main characters we've got characters like emma bovary so emma bovary is important uh, right emma bovary is a passionate woman she is aspiring she's aspiring to get into high society dress up well we can clearly see her romantic ideals so things haven't really changed from cervantes right so even uh, for example don quixote by cervantes is also going to talk about these romantic ideals these fantastical ideals that we have we are never realistic with regards to our life and our conditions that is what he's telling you so emma's first affair first affair is there right and ultimately she's committing suicide by taking arsenic so this was a question that was asked that emma consumes what does she consumes when she's committing suicide so emma is consuming arsenic right she's consuming arsenic she is also having a second love affair so the first love affair the second love affair but clearly we can see that at the end of the day she is ahead of her times and she's not guilty and therefore she's committing suicide she's not happy with the times in which she's living clearly she is repudiating the norms of the society she is castigating the norms of the society she refuses to accept the norms of the society okay so do keep that in mind 
this of course becomes important okay yes yes okay so this of course becomes important this is something that you have to remember good evening neeraj so do keep all these aspects in mind and of course we have charles bovary charles bovary the doctor husband he's a simple person and clearly uh, you know here uh, fleopath is not criticizing him but he's just saying that you know marriages were based on class concerns rather than being compatibly uh, made in the society and this is not just a in uh, like you know gustav fleubach but even charles dickens for example in hard times in the character of stephen blackpool and his unhappy marriage will tell you about how marriages were more placed on class consideration sons and lovers dh lawrence again he will tell you uh, by giving you a glimpse of the colliery uh, industry he's telling you how marriages were made on class considerations or even if they were not made on class considerations after the marriage the the period was bleak for the couple right therefore compatibility was emphasized by these writers so sorry so do keep all these aspects in mind because these are important things that these writers are talking about right and of course we are having the minor writers which you can refer to in the pdf that i will send you another most important writer that we are having is emile zola zola is considered to be a pioneer of naturalism he is considered to be a pioneer of naturalism when we talk about french literature emile zola is a character who's helping us tell about the fact that okay realism is good but what about the stark realism so zola even said zola said if you suppress for example like you know we don't want to talk about something we'll put it in Like under the carpet, we'll put it under under the carpet. That's a phrase. We don't want to discuss something. We will let it be. That is what Zola was trying to say. That if you are putting, if you are suppressing everything and you are putting it in the underground, remember it will grow. And the growth is coming in the form of naturalism. So naturalism will talk about issues that were considered to be taboo, that were considered to be iconoclast, that were considered to be in a way radical or things that no one was talking about. It is telling you about the seamy side of the society. It is telling you about the underbelly of the society. So clearly, telling you about the underbelly of the society, right? So do remember that whenever we are talking about Emile Zola, Emile Zola was very critical about the realism, but he was saying that we need to be even more critical to let the society know about the reality because otherwise, this society is incompetent to understand the realities. Right, he is famous for his series of twelve novels that he wrote between eighteen seventy one to ninety three. right and uh, they are of course following the fortunes of the rogans telling you about the fortune of the rogans so that is of course there he was the most well known practitioner of the literary school of naturalism like i told you so naturalism is a proponent that is getting developed by emile zola zola is the person responsible for bringing forth naturalism in the way that we know it now okay he was also there was a question that was asked he was also nominated for the first and second nobel prize in 1901 and 1902 he was also nominated of course he didn't win it but he was nominated for the nobel prize twice all right uh yes neeraj you're getting all the pdfs on the the grade up channel the telegram channel is where you're getting all the pdfs so just make sure that you know you are looking at the pdfs regularly for your references so we're giving you all of them okay so do keep it in mind do remember this that these are all important these are all crucial for your understanding and be very clear about these things okay i would rather die of passion than of boredom he was very clear you need to be passionate about your cause zola was absolutely clear that your passion would only help you succeed he was a political journalist and always remember naturalism is having this journalistic ability naturalism will not support a lot of subjective opinion it is more concerned with objective outlook so this journalistic political journalistic attribute is there in naturalism also 
right there is this autobiographical work la confession d or d doubt right and we can clearly see that his first major novel was teres raquin which we'll look at right now uh, and of course the four gospels of Gol uh, zola are fertility work truth justice these were the four gospels of zola what you need to remember about zola is that zola is saying that naturalism is something which is nothing but stark realism and this naturalism needs to have an objective attitude it should not be subjective it should rather have an objective attitude that was important for emile zola the subjective attitude was something that he was looking at okay thres rakin is a novel by zola and uh, this was published as unmarriage the armor in 1867 and of course it was published in the book form also right now here what you are able to see you are able to see that he is trying to he is trying to look at the analytical method analytical method is the naturalism method he is trying to use the naturalistic method the analytical objective method right so this is uh, like you know the this novel uh, is highly moral of course it's there it's unscientific uh, but at at the same time it is using one like you know pillar of naturalism that was analytical method even though naturalism was supposed to be non uh, moralistic it was supposed to be uh, scientific in nature but he was he wasn't being unscientific he was not being scientific he was being unscientific he was being didactic but one thing that was closer to naturalism over here that we saw was the analytical method okay was the analytical method that we need to keep in our minds okay i hope that's absolutely clear okay so uh, do re remember do make it a point now when we talk about the 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 entire work when we are looking at thres raquin thresy and her lover laurent they murder her weak husband camel so she along with her lover is murdering her husband and after marrying they are haunted by camel's ghost so clearly an element which is not uh, like you know particularly naturalistic but still using uh, a very important comment that they are making all right their passion for each other is converting into hatred and they eventually kill themselves so what you see is that you know there are two lovers who are killing the husband for the sake of uniting but ultimately they found they they grow so much hostile towards each other that they kill themselves right conservative readers accused zola of prurience the novel however illustrates the author's belief that sexual pleasure leads only to brutality and destruction many people said that he was being prurient he was being esturient he was in a way uh, being you could you could say uh, a little salacious Uh, related to the sexual elements that he was putting but remember that critics have also believed and they've also said that you know the the view that he had that all your physical appetites will only cause destruction and sexual appetite is one such appetite which according to zola will always lead to destruction and brutality okay so that is something that he was looking at uh, if you shut up truth and bury it underground it will but grow very important quotation of emile zola wherein he is trying to introduce you to the theory of naturalism naturalism is when you're talking about the underbelly naturalism is when you're talking about things that are going underground okay so naturalism is an important aspect that zola is talking about if you shut up the truth and bury it underground it will but grow. grow so if you're thinking that you will not speak about certain issues remember they will sprout remember they will grow remember you will have to talk about it so can you see that he is of course having a moral tone over here moral tone is that you know you've murdered your husband and both of you are also killed that's the moral tone for many people but remember look at the other details that he's giving you the other naturalistic details he's giving you so clearly he is telling you that sexuality is a mode of destruction that is being conveyed clearly categorically through his writings okay the meaning of life is to conquer the unknown zola was very clear about it he said we need to be in the pursuit of conquering the unknown 
Now, what was Zola's views on naturalism? He said naturalism is stark realism. So, for Zola, naturalism was a stark realism. It wasn't just realism, but it was stark realism in a way, right? During his lifetime, Zola, Zola was very popular. He was, of course, controversial writer, but very aptly, Zola has been called as a father of naturalism. Right. Why naturalism? Now, first, please remember that, you know, uh, naturalism is, of course, a subset of realism, but it is very different from realism in the fact that realism only presented the life. Right. Realism merely presented life with very similitude, very similitude as life is. They were presenting life. The, this is life. They were presenting life. So they were presenting life with the virtue of very similitude. OK, but when when you talk about naturalism naturalism is going ahead and it is giving you uh, like you know a slice of the underbelly so slice of reality slice of reality is realism slice of reality is given by realism but the slice of the underbelly the people whom you'll never talk about is being given by naturalism and Zola was a pioneer no one would talk about things that Zola was discussing Right. So that is a thin division that we can see, which, of course, becomes important. OK, so do keep that in mind. Sure, Shenaz, Shenaz Sabri, I would definitely guide you. Don't worry about it. OK, it's very, very inspiring. All right. Then coming on to the third writer that we are having, the third important writer is Jean Paul Sartre. Jean Paul Sartre is important because he is starting on with this entire belief of existentialism, which will fuel your absurd movement existentialism is questioning the being right it's questioning whether like you know why do we even exist why do we work because an ambani would also die a poor person would also die so it's all worthless it's all futile so existentialism was a modernist philosophy was a 20th century philosophy which was paying stress on what is the value of life what is the true value of life was the major discussion area of existentialism all right so uh Gita is asking, okay, Gita is asking this doubt. Uh, can you please explain stark realism? Okay, Gita, uh, now when you talk about, for example, like, you know, you all can see your screens. If you are describing your scene, right? If you're describing this, the entire scene. So if you describe whatever is available to you, all right. So what are you doing? You are trying to show you the like, you know, this is the reality. This is what you're seeing. And this is what you're writing. That is realism. Okay, for example, if uh, this is my house, all right. And if this is like, you know, say uh, a room in the house, which is very clean, which is very tidy. So realism will write things as it is that this was a tidy room, the cushions were at its place, the table was all there, the sofas were cleaned and vacuumed, the walls were painted. That is realism, Gita. But naturalism will just not look at the exteriors. Realism is looking at replicating the exteriors. Look at this. Realism is trying to look at your, it is trying to replicate your exteriors. Look and replicate your exteriors, the exteriors which are there. Naturalism will tell you that there is a story behind this. There might be some criminal activities. There might be some uh, like, you know, things that are not said in the society openly being done. So clearly, when you talk about naturalism, naturalism is stark realism. That means it's just not giving you the exterior reality, but it's going beyond that. It is trying to rip apart things that no one is talking about. So, for example, naturalism will talk about maybe like, you know, the criminals lives. Realism might not talk about that in greater detail. Naturalism will talk about uh, like, you know, the journey of prostitutes or sex workers. Naturalism will talk about and that, that's been seen in American literature also. Naturalism will talk about your the underbelly of the society, which is not the creamy layer of the society your beggars, uh, the crimes that are committed by beggars, the lives of drug addiction that the beggars are leading. That is naturalism. They are telling you about things that we do not want to discuss. Right. 
So that, of course, is something that we need to remember. Yes, existence precedes a sense. That's also there, Sneha. So do remember. Yes, absolutely, Sneha. Okay, so do remember this is what we mean. I hope Gita, it's clear now. Now, Jean Paul Sartre is one of the founding members of existentialism and phenomenology. Phenomenology is looking at like you know the origins of a particular phenomena, and both these we'll be discussing in theory as well. But do remember that these are important opinions that are shaping your twentieth century ideas on existentialism. All right, he had an open relation. Also, Jean Paul Sartre with Simone de Beauvoir. Simone de Beauvoir, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. The writer of The Second Sex, a feminist tract, and how she's saying that feminism is dealing with this entire gender construct, right? Male and female is biology, but man and woman is a gender construct, right? We are acting our roles as per this construct. So he had an open uh, relationship with Simone de Beauvoir, Jean Paul Sartre associated with existentialism. All right. In 1964, he received the Nobel Prize, but he refused it, saying that he always declined official honors and that a writer should not allow himself to be turned into an institution. He was strictly, strictly against the idea that you are getting appreciated by an external community because then you start thinking like them only. then you start uh, like you know using their ideas only okay so do keep that in mind yes sir be absolutely do keep that in mind that he, that he was averse to authority he had an aversion he was averse to authority he was not interested in paying attention to what the authority was saying and therefore he was refusing the prize right his best known work is some one one of you said no exist hell is other people hell is other people very very famous line hell is other people what do we mean by hell is other people that means whatever you think whatever conscience uh, of yours is thinking that's absolutely fine but the world that you're living in becomes unhappy because of other people around you because they will keep on telling you things that you need this you need that you're never satisfied therefore with the resources that you have in hand So hell is and is other people according to uh, according to Jean Paul Sartre. Sartre is very very clear that hell is other people. All right. You also have the age of reason, the reprieve, the troubled sleep. These are all important works of the trilogy that was written by Sartre. Okay, so Sartre, an important proponent of existentialism, existentialism, a belief that is questioning the existence of human beings. whether human beings genuinely exist or not we all ultimately would die what is the point of working existence is futile that is what these are some of the questions that existentialism is trying to deal with okay so do keep that in mind this of course becomes extremely crucial and important okay sartre stated in his preface to franz fano franz fano's work the wretched of the earth the wretched of the earth that to shoot down a european is to kill two birds with one stone to destroy an oppressor and this the man he oppresses at the same time there remains a dead man and a free man clive james attacked sartre's philosophy as all all opposed so basically uh, in like you know the preface that he is writing uh, to franz fanon's work the wretched of the earth the wretched of the earth he is of course not just telling these lines but otherwise also he was truly of the opinion that people do have a mindset created against the other community or people who don't look like their community members So of course Jean Paul Sartre is telling you about the essential identity question that what it is to be someone who doesn't looks like a european someone who doesn't looks like the majority of people what sort of problems he has to face what sort of issues he has to encounter so Jean Paul Sartre is helping us with the preface of Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth this is a direct question that is multiple times asked in your exams okay so do keep that in mind this is of course important uh, now Now, when we talk about Sartre, these are the most important works of Sartre that are there. We have nausea, we have the wall, we have the flies, we have the age of reason. We are having the respectable prostitute, the devil, and the good lord. These are all important works that are written by Jean Paul Sartre.
Kamu is a writer who is important for the stranger or the outsider. He's writing multiple other works also, and he's also receiving the Nobel Prize. He's also the writer of the Myth of Sisyphus, which is helping us with the development of the modern movement. The development of the modern movement is something that is helped and shaped in a way by the writings of Albert Camus. Okay, Albert Camus was French Nobel Prize winning author and he is basically contributing through his essay The Myth of Sisyphus on the idea of absurdism. Remember, he was born in Algeria. Okay, yes, that was a question in one of your PhD entrances that which of the following is actually the first African origin writer to win the Nobel. So uh, the first African origin writer to win the Nobel then is Albert Camus because he was born in Algeria. Okay, so that is, of course, important. No, Surbhi, abhi tak, whatever works I've told you except for Emma Bovary, you don't have to go into detail of any work so far that I've told you. Okay, and now start taking your questions very, very seriously, like, you know, five to ten questions on a daily basis. Do make it a point that that's becoming your, your second nature. Okay, so do keep that in mind. He also wrote this essay, The Rebel, right, uh, that his whole life was devoted to opposing the philosophy of nihilism while still delving deeply into individual freedom. So basically, uh, you know, Camus was not considering himself to be an existentialist, despite the fact that he was talking about what is the meaning of life, what is existence all about, it is repetitive, but still he was not believing in existentialism. Still he refused, still he refused used Right, Shainaz, uh, Sabri, uh, we have discussed all the books in one of the YouTube video. You can watch that video and still if you have doubts, you can let us know. Okay, so don't worry about it. So here clearly when we are talking about the rebel, in the rebel we can actually see that, you know, he was opposed to uh, nihilism, but he is in a way subscribing to the philosophies of uh, existentialism in his works or you could say the new, uh, like, you know, the new abnormal the reality of our modern living was clearly something that Camus was looking into, right? Camus did not consider himself to be an existentialist despite being classified as one. And please remember, he was the second youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize. He got the Nobel Prize at the age of 44. Earlier, it was Rudyard Kipling who had got it at the age of 42. Okay, so clearly we can see that, you know, uh, at this juncture, Camus is denying his identity. Camus says, no, I'm not an existential writer. I'm a normal writer. But his works are clearly showing his existence existential tone right the existential tone is very visible in his work yes absolutely absolutely sneha my mother died today or maybe uh, maybe day before those are the opening lines that we are having for the kamu okay for kamu's the stranger all right so do keep that in mind they're of course important this is something that you'll have to remember the stranger by kamu the stranger it was published as the outsider in england so it's called the stranger but it was published as the outsider in england and the stranger in uh, and it was published as the stranger uh, it was published as a stranger in the USA. So do keep that in mind that you are having both the titles. You have the stranger also as a title and you also have the outsider as a title. Both the titles are there for this particular work. OK, so it was the outsider in England. It was called the outsider in England, old English, outsider in English and stranger in the United States of America. Who's the stranger? The stranger is Merizolt. Merizolt is a person who is living in Algeria. He is uh, like, you know, a Ped Noir. Ped Noir, these are people who are coming and migrating to Europe from Africa predominantly. And like Sneha uh, had mentioned, I think Sneha had only mentioned, yeah, Sneha Prasad had mentioned the famous opening lines are my mother died today or maybe yesterday it was, I don't know, right? My mother died today or maybe day before, I don't know right so we can clearly see that you know he is a person who is so indifferent to his mother's death that he doesn't even know the date of the death and this is clearly articulating the modern condition that was prevalent the modern condition is getting articulated here okay uh, the reader is following Merisolt through the first person narrative 
of Marigo, Maringo, Maringo, who's there. So we come to know about Mersault. Mersault is the stranger or the outsider. Okay. Uh, now, basically, what is happening in the stranger and the outsider? This is actually a story where, uh, like, you know, they are killing. So Mersault is killing, and as a justification of the crime, when you know he's been asked to justify uh, or to at least plead guilty, he's not doing that. He's not having any remorse. He is very, very clear that he has no remorse for the killing, the murder that he has done. Thereby telling you that he is a stranger, he is the outsider, he is not like a common community member who if police has traced them, they will probably beg the police for mercy. He is not begging the police for mercy. And therefore he is an outsider despite being, so the opening lines are there, setting the tone, then he is implicated in the murder, right? But he is not justifying, he is not even remorseful about it. Why? Because he is representing a deadening of humanity and therefore he is a stranger. He is an outcast. He is not a part of the society anymore. Okay? Okay? So, do remember that. That, of course, uh, is a crucial aspect that we need to keep in mind. So, uh, Camus, novelist, essays, playwright, important work, Stranger, Plague, The Fall, right? And he's getting the Nobel Prize, as we can see. Stranger, published as Outsider in England, published as, like, you know, considered to be the stranger in the US. It's telling you about man's alienation from his fellow man, because of this godless universe that Nietzsche had proclaimed solidly that man is living in a world where God is dead. Nietzsche had proclaimed that God is dead vehemently, right? So, of course, Mar Marciot is there. Marciot fails to cry at his mother's funeral. Marciot is disintegrated and detached. He expresses no feelings and exhibits no empathy whatsoever. He's smoking in front of his mother's coffin right so we can clearly clearly see that he is least bothered and least interested he befriends Raymond uh, and he helps him to exact revenge on his girlfriend the woman's Arab brother and her friend then encounter Raymond at the beach and in an ensuing fight Raymond is stabbed Raymond is killed Raymond is stabbed to death his friend who had encouraged him to take revenge from his beloved. To take revenge from his beloved. Mersol returns to the beach and shoots the brother dead. Apparently not out of revenge but simply due to disorienting heat and annoying brightness of the sun. So clearly we can see that you know he is not taking any revenge for his friend. But on the contrary because of heat is killing the brother. Okay, so do remember the stranger and at the end of the day, he's got no remorse for killing this man. He's got no remorse. He's got no guilt whatsoever that he has, he's killed it. Okay, so this becomes important. This this is very, very crucial. This is something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, Lichi, this one also, this much is more than enough. There's no need to go into greater detail. Then, of course, we have the myth of Sisyphus, which is also by Albert Camus, wherein he's telling you about this man who rolls the, the, the rock up and the rock only comes back down. And what is the reason? The reason predominantly for this aspect is basically that that this is a symbolism of modern life that modern life we are engaging in repetitive work that is ultimately futile and we are doing the same things again and again just like sisyphus so the myth of sisyphus he's got a curse that he has to take the the rock up and oh, the rock will finally come down from the mountain and then again he has to take it up repetitive endless work which was symbolic in the modern society also okay so do remember that that of course is important this is something that you have to keep in mind Yes, yes, absolutely, Sneha, absolutely right, okay? So do keep that in mind. This is, of course, a crucial aspect. What we'll do is we'll stop over here. We'll continue with some writers tomorrow and then also look at German writers. If in case you are having any doubts, you can put it in the comments section. And let's look at uh, students who had joined us on the application if you're having any doubts also. So these are the application students. Let's quickly see your doubts. Good evening, Rabia. Hi, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, uh, so we will continue with Britlet on uh, on your Thursday, Friday and Saturday schedule. Okay. Uh, so if in case you will be having any doubts, 
Uh, Kesar is asking, naturalism is not related with nature. Kesar, naturalism is associated with reality and that too reality that no one is talking about. That is the main focus area of naturalism. Okay. Uh, Jas Janani is asking, what is nihilism? Nihilism is when you don't consider the importance of anything in this life. That is called nihilism. Everything is zero for you. There is no importance of anything in, in the life. Everything is futile, whatever you do. That is nihilism. Okay. That's very sweet of you, Daisy. That's very sweet of you, Sneha. Okay. So do keep all these aspects in mind. If you have any concerns, please put it in the comment section. And if there are any other problems, do let me know about it. Uh, we will continue from here tomorrow and we'll also look at your German writers. Take care. God bless. Bye.